We're going to go in three, two, one. Lions Lounge Lockdown, episode 18. Kenny Cunningham, thanks for joining us, mate. How are you, Ken? Yeah, all good. All good, Dan. We just, had a, we just had quite a lengthy chat off camera. If we got a fitting didn't, didn't record, <laughs> we was well away there, mate, weren't we? Yeah, yeah, it all comes flooding back. Uh, yeah, no, it's good. I don't get an opportunity, in all honesty, to reminisce too much, generally uh, speaking, but certainly not uh, in the Millwall days. Obviously, it would have been the first club uh, back in the dim and distance. So, no, I wouldn't have had too many opportunities over the last couple of years to be uh, uh, chilling the fat, as they say. Well, mate, as I said to you before, the fans were very excited you're coming on. Many say. I'm almost disappointed. Everyone. Is that number 18? I'm 18 on the list. Is that what you said? Yeah, number 18, yeah. Thanks. I'm on the dial race. I, said, I wasn't, wasn't, didn't even make the top 10, not even close. <laughs> <laughs> Give me oh. you know what it was. We need to start with the 90s, mate. We've done, we've done the noughties first, and now we step back into the 90s. But, um, oh, is that it? Just logistically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, look at this way, mate. This is going to be the last one before the football season starts again. So we'll save the best till last. Let's say that. <laughs> you joined the club in 1989 till 1994. Um, a young Irish boy comes over from Tolka Rovers, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I was enough, Dan. I'll give it out. Yeah. How does um, how does that come about, Millwall especially? Yeah, it was a long story. I'd, I'd, I'd like to say I was spotted by the chief scout in Dublin. He only saw me play for ten minutes and thought this lad's special. We got to have him before the likes of Tottenham and Arsenal jump in and get him. But clearly, that, <laughs> clearly that wasn't the case. It was a very long, drawn-out process. It was the longest ever trial. It lasted about two years. <laughs> <laughs> and even then, I only got a one-year contract and about 40 quid a week in my pocket at the end of it. But um, no, it was, I was lucky, really, Dan. There was, um, I was recommended to Bob Pearson, who was Millwall's chief scout, um, by my manager in Dublin. Don't ask me how he had the contact. And over a long period of time, uh, I travelled over, played a number of games for the U team, actually illegally, if the truth be known. <laughs> I used to be, I used to, I used to finish school in Dublin uh, on a Friday afternoon. I, my dad used to drive me up to the airport, uh, smuggle me on a, on a flight to London. He used to be picked up by uh, Bob, uh, Bob Pearson. I don't know if that was legal, juvenile. I would have been under 18 at the time. But Bob used to pick me up, take me back home. He used to stay the night with him and his wife uh, Friday evening and play me a uh, youth team football game. What was the youth uh, the league called at the time? What was the name of it? It was a great league. It was a very strong league. And um, the way it was structured at the time, all the top London clubs uh, were in there. Was it so the South East Counties? South East Counties, that was it. Yeah, of course it was. So I'd roll out, play a South East Counties game on a Saturday morning, 11 o'clock kickoff, uh, scoot back to the den if we had a home game uh, for 3 o'clock and be on a flight back to Dublin uh, at 6, 6 o'clock uh, in the evening to play me schoolboy football in Dublin on the Sunday morning. Now, that wasn't every week, don't get me wrong, but as much as I could, now, that was strictly illegal, it shouldn't really have happened, but... There was there was no way there was no way around that. I literally needed to kind of you know impress, and the best way to do that would have been in that in that southeast counties league because it was very good, some very good players. It was very strong, and it was a huge step up for me. I mean, some good players in Dublin schoolboy football is was strong and is very strong, but there was an obvious uh, uh, difference step up in terms of quality, and it was tough. So it was a bit of an indicator for them in terms of could I cut the mustard. So clearly then. They weren't convinced initially <laughs> and continued to roll me yeah, and continued to roll me over. I actually broke a wrist, funny enough, as well on one of the trials. Went up to uh, John Dockley actually was the first time he came up to see me play. I think Bob had, had a look at me a few times, decided maybe this kid's got something to offer. And obviously he knocked on John Dock's door and said, Look, you need to have a look at this kid. He probably would have had the final say down in terms of where they got me. So I remember I flew into Luton Airport, maybe wait to Luton Dunstable for a uh, it would have been youth game as well, actually. And John Dock turned up. So this was the big thing. I was told that John Dock was coming up to... So that was panic station straight. I wasn't a, I wasn't the most confident kids to begin with. <laughs> so that was the last thing I needed to be told. The first thing I managed was come to see me play. Anyway, I probably played a, a part. I, I fell out, tripped over my heels and about 10 minutes in and went down on my wrist, broke my wrist. Oh, no. Yeah, ambulance straight to the hospital. Well, fair play. John Dock and his wife, actually, and uh, Bob, Came into my hospital room. <laughs> came into the hospital room that night. I don't know if I'd been up, if I'd been operated on. I was being operated on the following morning. And actually, it was nice. They came in and said, "Look, don't think this is the end of it. Get yourself ready. There'll be another opportunity when you come back." So that was nice. It was a nice touch, actually. Yeah. 
remember that it would have been very easy for the manager to go, John Doc to go home and maybe just allow Bob to pop his head in and whatever. But the fact he went out of his way, and I was, you know, 17 years of age, scally like, you know what I mean? But the fact he went out of his way and came actually meant a lot, uh, to be honest. So I got myself back to Dublin, got myself fit, went through the process again. Eventually, uh, long story short, uh, yeah, Bob broke the news that Millwall would be offering me a one year contract. And that was, like you said, and that was the summer of 89. I think come over actually to August, before second week of August, when I actually came over to the football club. So I missed most of the pre season. But I wouldn't say it was a bit of a jolly. I was obviously very, you know, very proud. Uh, mm. But I deferred all the. So I'd, I'd applied for a few colleges in Dublin. To be honest with you, I just deferred them for a year because in the back of my mind, I was thinking, look, it's a year's experience. Go over, give it a lash. But come, if you come back, I'll have me college there. And I can play a bit of League of Ireland football in Dublin. So I wasn't allowing myself to kind of hope really that the, there would be a career there for me. I kind of almost in the back of me, in the back, even the front of me might think, well, listen, it's only a year. You know, just enjoy it. Get yourself back home at the end of it. You know, you'll be better for the experience. So that was really it. How did it come around? You know, you must have been a good player. Was there other interest from other clubs? Was your, was, your, was your youth, and what was your youth uh, coach saying to you? How does, how does he describe Millwall to you as a club? <laughs> a boy from boy from Dublin going over to London. What did he say? Me was all about. Did he tell you? No, we didn't. Well, there's been a small connection there, Dan, because we had a couple of um, uh, Eamon Dunphy would have been the, one of, probably the first famous Irish player. Would he went over and established mm. a reputation at the football club? And obviously, Cass had come in at that time as well, didn't he? Signed from Gillingham, and probably I'm thinking if Cass had a broken, he would have done. He just, he was playing in the Ireland team, but. At that point, he just broke into the Irish international uh, setup. So, Cass would have had a bit of profile. Kevin O'Callaghan there as well. Yeah. Would have had a couple of caps as well. Although, to be fair, Kevin O'Callaghan never spoke for about six months. And I saw the <laughs> <laughs> what? He was one of those few players. I mean, a lot of the older uh, pros frightened me at the football club. But Kevin O'Callaghan, my God. If I was walking, if I saw him in the car park and I was walking, I'd literally die behind the car. Literally <laughs> behind the car. Because... Kevin made a hard few. He was a typical old pro at the time. No badness uh, to, his, to the largest end, Dan, but mm -hmm. young pro, like, I mean, you'd get, this, you'd get the scowl off him, like, you know what I mean? And who are you, like, who the hell are you looking at? Are you looking at mine? You know, so you, <laughs> you got a little bit of that boy off him. Not in a bad way, like you said, but I wasn't the most confident. So even Kevin, or, or his international, you know, you think, oh, he's an artist, you know, he has a kicky calf seat. He'll make an effort, he'll come over. Come on, lad, let's go and get a bit of lunch. Yeah, yeah, let's go down to the breakfast forever. No, nothing, nothing whatsoever. Cass was a little bit better, to be honest with you. I literally, I don't think those lads even heard my voice. Honestly, for the first six months of the football club, I mean, talk about keeping a low profile. I mean, I literally just head down, used to come in, do me training and do whatever I could and get out of there, you know. And it wasn't because it was a great environment and it was a great, they were a great bunch of players. But the age distance wasn't just the age, Dan. You had the likes of uh, Alan McClear. I can picture that team now that I went, not the team that I went in, but the team that was there is established. Brian Horn in goal. I can see them uh, on the cold blow line coming out, being in formation. Keith Stevens, Woody, Alan McClear, the Ian Dawes had just come to the football club. Les Broyley, Terry Horlock, you'll know them all. Jimmy Carter on the wing. I'm not sure, sure Paul Stevens had arrived that first year. He might have come the second year. And then, of course, Cass and. Uh, uh, Teddy up front and obviously a sprinkling of people around it but that was the that was the team and that was a battle hard they were kind of mid late 20s a lot of those lads like although I was 18 you think that's not a massive jump there in terms of age in terms of mentality and maturity levels I would have been a very young uh, 18 year old coming out of Dublin you know I wasn't like the street fortune you know outpound the streets of Dublin at 14 years of age like that so, you know that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't me at all like you know um, so I, you know, I wouldn't very much school, home school, work, train, and football, and that was it. So to be thrown in there was a big. It was a totally different environment for me, and I probably took a step back for for a significant period of time. I didn't really throw myself into it. That it was kind of wow, this is amazing. These lads, these players, but there wasn't a there wasn't a real connection there. It was only for the thankfully for the likes of uh, John Goodman signed mm. very quickly after I came to the football club. But he kind of hit it off with a bit bit in common. And the likes of Davy Thompson. Davy Thompson was a great lad. Kind of went out his way. A very funny lad. Alan Dowson, Sean Spardham, players like that. A couple of years, they kind of bridged the gap a little bit between me mm -hmm. and, and those lads, kind of mid to late twenties. And they kind of they made things a bit easier for me. It made it easier for me to settle in. Yeah, you walked straight into. As I said, 
I remember you, I must have been about 10, sort of 1990. So I remember my dad saying, you know, we've got this young Irish kid and you just looked so much younger than the rest of the squad. They was all, as you said, seasoned pros come through the divisions, a lot of them. And how, I was going to ask you that in my notes, how difficult was that to sort of, was you in digs originally and was you just, you know, was it struggle hard to make friends and just sort of get, get involved with the boys? Because that could be a massive part for a young, young Irish boy away from home. Uh, you're right, but it's probably a good thing I didn't get involved. <laughs> I didn't get involved too much because it would have been a lively enough little social uh, side of things there, even for the younger pros. Mm. And like I said, I, I was a little, I, even back in Dublin, that really wasn't my thing, Dan, even in growing up. So, yeah, so it would have been like very boring. Like, so I would have been training, stay around the train, and do as much as I could, get the trains. I was in West Norwich for my first year. So that was a bit of, that wasn't easy getting back out there uh, after training. But weekends would have been keeping me head down. I was very lucky, Dan. I had a young lad from Dublin now with me for six months. Mark Madden, you, you wouldn't remember. They gave him a six-month contract to come over. More of a trial period. Now, they didn't take him on, but he was in digs with me. We were in a little box room together, both for single beds for six months. So that did, made things a lot easier. And there was a couple of other lads there as well, actually. White, white TSs, because uh, the landladies used to take maybe three or four at the time. So there'd be a couple of lads sprinkled in the digs as well. Mm. So that was enough. Uh, Dan, to be all honest with you, I get down the off lights the weekend, get a few sweets in and a few videos. Blockbuster, Blockbuster's best customer I was. Like, I think I was a gold, I was a gold card member there, the amount of money I used to spend. But literally, um, that was it. That was literally it for me. For from before, from a social point of view, like I said, that was enough. And those younger lads are training, the Davy Thompsons, and just just enough little interaction there. Steve Torpy actually was another lad. He was there in the U team. Darren Tracy, Phil Babb, funny enough, was in the team as well. Phil went on, had a great career, as did Steve, actually, on the, in the lower leagues, but had a fine career as well. So there was just enough contact there just to make me feel as if, you know, part of it to a, to a small extent, like, you know what I mean? But, but the football, the, the, the big shock as well was the football side of things. Because you, you wouldn't know that. I mean, I never, I played, uh, when I came, I played right back. They pushed me into right back because I couldn't play centre half. I was a centre half, played all my career centre half in Dublin. But I was like ten and a half stone, and like you know, ne never seen the inside of the gym before I came over to Millwall. No body strength. Technically, actually, I wasn't very good at all. Uh, Dan, it's it, it's amazing, really. Like I made a jump. You mentioned about that I stand out in Dublin. The simple question answer is I didn't. I didn't stand out at all. I was very fortunate. If you're asking like the top twenty uh, best players around Ireland at that time in my year, I, I wouldn't even have got a, a mention. So I was very fortunate. But I, I was pushed into right back because physically I couldn't cope at centre half. So I actually had to land the position at right back. And they might say, oh, so what's the difference in defence? But there is the significant difference positional mm -hmm. centre, particularly playing right back to centre half. So I had to learn that. And even kind of add a big uh, part to the game in terms of it as an attacker going forward. Because the years I was at Millwall, I, I probably gained a small bit of a reputation in terms of actually getting forward and maybe getting crosses into the box, that type of thing, Dan. Yeah. But, but I never, I literally, anybody who saw me playing Dublin as a, as, a, as a kid would say, that lad never stepped over the halfway line. Now, I literally never stepped over the halfway line playing the centre. I didn't know I was a natural defender. I loved me defending. And I wasn't, technically, I wasn't very good. I wasn't very comfortable on the ball, even dribbling with the ball. Dan, so I, I had no business in the opposition's half the pitch. Literally, I had never set foot. <laughs> oh, so you must, have, you must have had something special. You're not, you're, not, you're not really selling yourself, but you must have had something in there. This is what I'm saying. So, but at least I had, a, I had the, not the forest, so I, I do, very quickly, I, I knew well, I have to land this position, this right back. I've got to make myself a better defender. I've got to get physically, I've got to improve. I've got myself physically stronger. I've got to get more proficient on the ball technically. I've got to spend more time on the ball. My head needs to improve, lots of things. But also getting forward, I, I know I had to get forward in from a right back position. It's not like it is today, you know, full backs are invariably they're, you know, the converted wingers and their positions 20 yards the pace they're expected to do that. Back in the day, you were a right back at the defend, but you're expected to get forward and support your winger, get beyond them and make a contribution in the last tour of the pitch. So that's what I had to do. I had to try to develop that and add that to my game. So from a football, so from a mature point of view, development, I, I was I needed to step up. But from a footballing point of view, I had to make big strides in that first year because I knew as if there probably wouldn't be another contract there for me. I need to make I needed to make big improvements uh, in a very short period of time. It was we said an iconic Millwall side that had been promoted, but we was obviously in the second season on a way to relegation. So. It's difficult to make your mark, I suppose, in a side that's struggling, especially with them season pros. And who was, would, would it have been Ryan Hart right back? Would you sort of, I know you didn't make your debut straight away, was he sort of thinking, hang on, who's this little prick? I didn't have to worry about me. <laughs> <laughs> I 
he didn't have to worry. He decides me like Rhino could like, pick me up with one, uh, one hand. And the type of player that Rhino was, he was legend when his fans loved him. You now physically aggressive. You now he was like steaming into those tackles. He would have got the whole pre- crowd up. They absolutely loved him. That type of player, didn't they? Traditionally, there was a lot of those players, wasn't there? In Millwall's history, and he was of that ilk, and he was loved because of it. But I was, a, I was, the, I was the total opposite for the for the reasons that I said. I was like a little ballerina compared <laughs> to my right back. So he he had nothing to worry about. So so that first year, you're right. Obviously, we got relegated. I was probably the kiss of death, to be honest with you. That wasn't my only relegation uh, in my career, and it hurt everybody. It hurt those older lads in particular, Dan, because they were like they'd worked so hard to get there, and a number of them probably knew they probably wouldn't get an opportunity to get back there. Mm. It was slightly different for me. I was 18. You know, you don't think too far ahead. I've been lucky enough. I made a few. I made. I think it was five appearances for the end of the season. Bob threw me and got the job, and gave me a couple of games, and that was absolutely amazing. We played Spurs. Sorry, was that the five nil game? Spurs at home. I think it's five nil. That might have been the season before. <laughs> I didn't think it was five. Honestly, I think they won. Gascoigne played in Linica. That was massive for me because the year before I was watching these on TV and stuff. And I remember trying to get close to Gascoigne a couple of times, thinking, "Yeah, I'll try and yeah, you know, I get touch tight and make, you know, make things difficult." And like, and when, I, I, the first time he caught me with his elbow in the face, it was literally like I, I didn't realise what had happened. I, so, so you're naive. I went back again two minutes later for a little bit. Yeah, I try and get maybe take the ball out, blah, blah, blah. Worse, because Gascoigne was notorious for using his upper body. He was very clever, as good as he was. He good upper body strength. If you, if you came within him close to him, you'd get one of them. So everybody knew, apart from me, obviously, being uh, new on the block. So I remember getting a couple, a couple of them, a couple of bloody noses off him. I remember Kerry Dixon playing against us for Chelsea. He might have got a hat-trick. I wonder if that was the game, Dan. Chelsea beat as well, I think, towards the end of the season. He got a hat trick. He was a lovely player, Kerry Dixon. So it was mixed emotions. Yes, I was mm. disappointed. I went on the Premiership, but it didn't hurt as much. I didn't realise it at the time. I realised it later, Dan, because I would have been in that position and be told he's getting relegated. I know how it felt then, but it was a different. That yes, it kind of hurt, but it didn't hurt. It didn't cut as deep as it would have done with those older lads. So I was lucky enough. There was another year, maybe two years. I can't remember at the end of it. So for me, it was a case of, well, learn from the experience. I've got a new contract and keep trying to develop and getting uh, better going forward and try and get, obviously, maybe a few more appearances, which wasn't going to be easy. But the good thing about Rhino was, because I knew the type of player that he was, I knew I just had to be patient. You knew he was good for at least kind of at least six, eight games to spend. <laughs> it, was a given. it was a given. So I was thinking, uh, by November, he'll have 10 yellow cards. That was an absolute insanity. So that was a two-game suspension. I knew the odds are he would have at least one red card by November. So I used to factor in by Christmas, I'd have about four or five games. Absolute minimum. And then would rack up again second half of the season, more suspensions for him. So that was, a, that was literally it for the first couple of years. But I got lucky. Eventually, Ryan went in centre half. Mm-hmm. Kind of made lost his legs a little bit. But he more experienced he became. He was a good defender, Ryan, a good organiser. I think it was Bruce Rio probably eventually would have put him inside alongside Colin Cooper and yeah. come to the foot, opened a bit of his space there. So that's when I began to get a little bit more of an opportunity in a few more games. Mm-hmm. Uh, belt. But that was the only reason. Ryan had to be playing right, but I never would have got in. We <laughs> say so you didn't make your debut for six months, I think it was. You made your debut against Norwich in a 1 1 draw. As you mentioned there, John Doherty lost his job um, and Bob Pearson took over. You said, which was good for you. Bob Pearson was the man that scouted you, obviously. Um, and that's, that's when you got your chance. You remember making your debut? I don't remember much of the game. I remember it, it being in the hotel probably a couple of hours before as you do. You're leaving the hotel pre-match for me and then you come together for a bit of a team meeting before you get on the coach and head to the ground maybe two hours before the uh, kick-off. I was in the squad and I've been in the squad a few times before. You know, 18 man, just a bit of experience, that type of thing. And you're right, Bob had got a, a job but I didn't have any, didn't give me any indication that he was famous. So he named the team. And I think it was Dennis Salmon, I think, had been playing previously. Mm. And he said he's Brian, he would have gone Brian Hart. I would have been listening because I would have been interested. And uh, right back, uh, Kenny, Kenny Cunningham. Honest to God, Dan. Stomach just, just dropped. Everything just dropped down. My chicken and beans, everything onto the floor. <laughs> so my face probably didn't betray it. I might have done. I might have gone white. But the lads obviously weren't looking nobody but literally I do remember that sensation and I kind of held it together Dan I got on the coach a couple of the lads would have given me a little nod maybe probably not making too big a deal of it probably the right thing to uh, to do and I got on the coach my head was spinning oh, absolutely spinning panic mode to be honest with you it really was 
And when we got to about a couple of minutes from the ground, we came over a bridge and you could actually see down to the stadium and there's a lot of streets and people meandering, all the supporters making their way down to the ground. So you got a really broad outlook at the whole thing and how big the occasion was. <sighs> Honest to God, sweating, done proper. Like, I literally do remember having to kind of, you know, you have those internal kind of conversations, just, just calm down, calm down, just take a few breaths. So it was a real battle. And I got through it. I'd say it was about, I vaguely remember this because I used to end up running for the South London Press, used to do a report on the games. Yeah. Because I always run. I got into have a running because it was a big thing. South London used to mark people. Oh, it was L5, was it? I think L5 was now L10. They used to mark people L5. And uh, I remember running to get to South London, <laughs> South London Press after the game. But I, I was literally, it was, a, it was a kind of a 6 out of 10 performance at best. Dan, I didn't make too many massive errors, but didn't make a huge contribution. Re re constant battle with the nerve, but kind of got through it. And it was yeah. great. I couldn't believe it. It was an amazing feeling. I think we drew one all. I think we possibly got a draw or nil all. Yeah, it was like one that. Yeah. yeah, but it was, but that, that was the overriding feeling. I know you get people talking about their debuts. Oh, you, was more, you was more interested in getting a seven than the result. You just wanted that seven in the South London press, didn't you? <laughs> Honest to God, but it was yeah. That was kind of a you miss, of course you missed those emotions at the time. You're thinking, oh, this is horrible and stuff. But again, you know, in hindsight, you think back and you think, oh, to have those type of uh, feelings again. Didn't have that too. I had a couple of times later, a little bit later in my career, sim similar emotions. Make me international uh, debut. Maybe there was a little bit of that. I was a little bit older at, at, at the time, but yeah. But that that moment there was like was huge for me. And then, how long did it take before you sort of? You said at first you was in digs in Norwood and the, the first teamers weren't really having you. At what point did you feel like, yeah, I'm sort of starting to belong here now? Um, did, did your living situation change? Were you still in digs or? Saf, I needed to go Saf for the river. That's where it all came good for me. <laughs> <laughs> came for, yeah, I came over to digs in the uh, Sid Cup and that was it. I stayed there for a long period of time. We just speak about it before mm. uh, uh, I came on board. So came, came, went to the digs there, very close to where training ground in. And New Elton, I don't know if you remember that, Danny, forever down there. We trained back to back with Charlton. Yeah. Uh, just off, not too far from Melton Hoist. It was a lovely little train ground by the road there. I really, I really enjoyed it. I mean, the facilities weren't great, don't get me wrong, but the pitches were kind of decent enough. It was handy uh, to where I was in digs then. So I thought that's where I kind of settled down. Started getting a few more games under my belt. Bruce Riak, of course, had come in that second mm -hmm. season. It was the second season, wasn't it, Dan? Uh, Bob yeah, was on the comes in second season, um, and we have a good season. Nearly go straight back to the top flight. Good side he was around at that point as well. Really good, some really good players. Yeah, it was two years. I think he stayed, Bruce, and I played a few more games. It wasn't a regular, but came in, and more players came in. I think this the Scottish Brigade came in there, didn't they? John McGinley, you mentioned John McGlashan, who was a great lad. Mm. I mean, I kind of got on well uh, with John. Colin Cooper came in, was a very good player. Uh, Bruce mm. made there. Uh, uh, it's captain. So, yeah, in terms of personnel, there was a big turnover. I think T Terry stayed, didn't he? A number of players would have stayed. I think Terry stayed for a, a couple of years, did he? Because I remember the day, do you know yeah. what? Because my memory wouldn't be great down, but I remember the day Terry left. And I think Mick, I think Mick would have been the manager by then. And I was in early. I used to come in reasonably early because, like I said, like uh, uh, I would have got in and done me a few bits and even after training, tried to do as much as, uh, much as I could. I can't remember, it was early in the morning or it was late in the afternoon when most of the lads had gone. Mick pulled Teddy, called Teddy into his room. And as he came out of Mick's room, I was just walking to the main area. There wasn't, I don't think there was anybody there. And I'd literally never seen that because Teddy would have been a bit of a kind of lovely fella, Teddy, when he got to know him. didn't get to know him that well, but a very nice fella. But you know what he was like? He had this kind of presence about him. Like he had a bit, a bit of a scowl on his face as well. He wasn't a smiler. Terry, <laughs> 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 wouldn't have got around that pair of it's a bit like Kevin Gallan, like that that crew, like up all day. So you're going to keep your distance a little bit. Although he was very good, Terry. I, I got to uh, like him a lot by the time he left. But Terry came out of Mick's room and it actually jolted me. He actually jumped. He kind of jumped in the air and he had this massive uh, smile on his face. And Mick had obviously just given the news that Rangers had made a bid, had been accepted by the club, and he was. <laughs> to go and talk to him yeah and I'd never seen that Terry that type of reaction from him I'm sure it was when Mick was the manager and he was gone of course he went and got stuff he was gone he, he was up the road because I, I used to think Terry left very quickly after that the likes of Les Broly and number of the lads would have kind of moved on off the back of that relegation Dan but Terry actually 
stayed around. Yeah, because funny enough, when he came back, he came back to the club at a time, and boy, Jesus, we had because I I done a bit of I used I've been doing a bit of TV work the last few years on and off. I got talking to Brian Little over in Dublin once. He was doing a bit of work over there as well. Nice fella, Brian. And he was asking the Villa manager, uh, was asking, no, Leicester manager at the time. And he said to me once, he said, can you play, did you play Mill? Your, Mill I said, yeah, that's right. He said, a couple of uh, years, Brian. He said, yeah, I brought me Leicester team down there one, one year. And he said, I said, did you? I said, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't remember. I said, my memory would be the best. He said, well, you must remember that game. Uh, the new then. I said, no, any reason why I'd remember it? And he went, I'll give you one reason. You know, first reason was like the first sending off, which was about, uh, I think it was about 10 minutes in, Terry. Terry went down the tunnel. And of course, then we had like, we had Pat Van Den Ho- uh, Pat Van Den Hel, Yeah, yeah. And with Gavin McGuire in the squad at the time. And those three lads. Oh, God. <laughs> Having those three lads on the pitch, it was, it was, I mean, Terry was, Terry was hard as there was. Don't get me wrong, but he, but, but he could be quite quite an introverted off the pitch. Mm. Uh, Terry Pat was like different type of physically. He was different, quite lean, a bit of a uh, you know catwalk freak. Well, he good looking lad. Pat yeah, was. He was yeah. Yeah. I put a picture of him up the other day on social media actually because we've had some good stories on him and people thought it was Jamie Ridnap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good looking, good dresser. You know that type of fella. We wouldn't have been in the same circle. Put it that way. But yeah, <laughs> I had those had those mad eyes. Absolutely, you know, kill you. Absolutely kill you, like you look. And then Gavin, and then Gavin McGuire, and Gavin was like probably a bit of both of them. Gavin was like, Gavin was mad. Gavin was absolutely mad. And so I have this three of them at the football club at the same time. But that particular day, Terry went off. Pat went off for the second half as well. They had a player sent off. They had someone sent off. It shouldn't have been sent off. It was a mad game. It was about six goals in that in the whole game. And Brian went through it, going in chronic, uh, chronological order. I couldn't remember any of it. All these things that he went through it. And eventually said, do you remember it now? I said, you know what, Brian? I said, I do, yeah. It was mad. That was a mad game. But that would coincide with Terry's return, you're right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. to the football club. But he's obviously a different person. He had his career up and range, and he'd done great up there. And he hadn't, um, obviously, maybe a small drop-off mm. when he came back to the football. But he was loved. Uh, uh, Terry, what well, fans absolutely loved him. But we were playing a different... Probably a different time, maybe a different type of style of play then as well, because Mick was in the chair there at the moment. And mm. it was a little bit different, a little bit functional when I first went to the football club. John Doc was there 4 4 2. And I don't mean functional in a derogatory uh, point of view. Let's take it back before we get on to, to Mick McCarthy as, as, a, as a manager. Obviously, Big Mick was signed by Bruce Rioch. Um, yeah. He must have been a bit. He must have been like a bit of a legendary player as well for you to come into the club. He must have been a bit like, fucking is Mick McCarthy? Because he captained. He captained the uh, uh, Republic of Ireland in 1990, uh, USA, USA yeah. 94, wasn't it? As, That's right. And Italian 90. Yeah, massively so. Yeah, Mick was huge, huge uh, profile in Ireland at the time. He might have just finished playing for Ireland maybe a couple of years at that stage because he was literally, Mick would have been 34, 35 then at least. Dan, he was literally, his legs were gone. But kind of Bruce brought him back and put him, kind of moulded the team around him. He, he, we played a back five, Mick played the middle of a three. Which was okay because I actually played to the right. I've actually played a wing back and played right side of him. And Mick was good. He was a good organizer, you know, good information, which was good for me. Obviously, young player developing and learning, uh, learning the game. And he needed a bit of legs around. And I wasn't ridiculously quick, but I was mobile enough, like so. I kind of suited Mick to have a couple of legs around. Him. But he didn't play much. He only played a few games towards the end of the season, and then he finished. Damn, didn't he? And then that coincided with Bruce uh, leaving the football club, and Mick was obviously. Uh, offered the job, wasn't he? So mm. fortunate for me because it was the first time Mick got the job. He, that was his first pre-season and very early in the pre-season, uh, Dan, it might have been even a, a pre-season game. Uh, maybe it was even training. The first time we put an 11 v 11 on in training and you always kind of knew, you know, the 11 v 11 came out in training maybe two, three weeks into pre-season and he kind of, you, you, you kind of put the team out. You thought, right, that's the bones of the team. He's thinking kind of going forward. You know, I might change here and there. But the first time he took out the jersey, he gave me the, the number two jersey. He gave me the right back jersey. And I looked around. It was pretty much the kind of first team. And that kind of gave me a lot of confidence. Without saying a lot, that was kind of him probably telling me, well, you're, you're my man. And that's the yeah. first time that had happened. Although I played a few games under Bruce, so I never felt as if he was like, well, you're my number one, you know, 
which was fair enough. I'm not, I wasn't the perfect player then. I was still developing and improving. So I'm not saying it was the wrong decision by Bruce, but it was the, it was the first time something the manager gave me the jersey and basically throw you're my man, it's yours, you know, keep mm. your at that level and you're going to stay in the team. So that gave me a little bit, bit of a shot of confidence, which was good, which I probably needed. Let's talk about Bruce. So Doc gets sacked. Uh, Bob Pearson comes in temporarily. Bruce comes in. First season, it went very well. What was he like as a manager? I've, we've, I've heard mixed, a mixed bag. I've heard he was quite regimental. Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. But no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't mind that in terms of uh, kind of, I think managers, as you get older, you, the better managers, the best managers, good people skills, um, very good with people, different sorts of mm. people. Just a nice manner to them, you know, can interact with people, all sorts of people. It's not uh, a problem. And he, he was never, I wouldn't say he was aloof or rude or anything like that, but he had that kind of the military background, didn't he? His kind of family and stuff. And, and regiment was probably a, a good war, but not to the point where I always felt he gave everybody respect, even the, even the younger players. But he obviously, maybe you felt there was a little bit of a distance there uh, between you. You know, it didn't maybe make it easy. Those conversations didn't exactly flow. But that mm. was okay, like, you know, because I, I, I felt as if I, I did respect them. And I tell you what, he did surprise me on the training pitch. I don't know how old he was at the time, but I remember once doing some set pieces and they were trying to do a corner, right? And he wanted this corner where he wanted a corner taker to deliver it with the outside of his foot. <laughs> if you think about it, you don't see too many corners delivered. Oh. To the outside. I was leaving the game. I couldn't hit the ball with the outside of my foot. And he was asking our lads to, to deliver the ball into the seat box there. And the lads like were struggling with it, and you know on the on the on the practice ground, if it kind of if it labours a little bit, a certain thing, it's too long. I guess we're point this is too long. We need to kind of move on. And it got to the point where uh, Bruce went, right, give me a ball, and he mar- <laughs> and he marched out to the corner flag on the out and with the outside of his left foot and his right foot because he was uh, two footed as a player. Didn't see a lot of side bit of him play afterwards. Funny enough, I remember talking to a few people said he yeah, a very good player, very two foot, two good feet. And he swaz those balls in, those corner kicks in with the outside of his right and his left foot. Now, he would have been, I would have been maybe mid 40s, 40, 40, mid 40s at the time. Mm. That gave me, I remember looking at it, even something like that, that you might think, oh, you don't get, you don't get respect for that. But as football players, something like that, you do look at people and think, oof, well, you might be Yeah, he's got a bit. Yeah, you get a little bit off place. It's not everything, don't get me wrong. The, the, the people skills are important as well, and maybe that's why maybe there's a maybe a slight little bit of friction maybe between himself and a, and a few players. But I I I was there. I enjoyed working with him. He loved the game, Dan. He absolutely loved it. A bit of a student in the game. Mm. Yeah, had a lot of time for. It wasn't a job. It wasn't an earner for him. Being a manager it is with okay. someone. He absolutely loved it. It was. Um... I find it a bit of a fascinating time because I don't really remember it that well and now I'm finding out a bit more about it from players. But he, he had a good eye for a player as well. He made some good signings, didn't he? Alex Ray came into the club. Uh, Malcolm Allen uh, sort of came into the club around that time. Yeah. Uh, Paul Kerr, uh, Gavin McGuire. And you said, what are these characters like? Because you famously as well, you, we've heard a lot of stories of, of drinking. You famously didn't drink, but apparently you was still the last man standing and a fucking good driver home <laughs> as well. <laughs> I was the last man standing because they demanded that I drive everybody home at the end of the night. But <laughs> 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 he was too tired to pay for that taxi. Yeah, can you come along? Yeah, come out. You bring your car out. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can come. <laughs> I didn't clock that one about a year and a half in. Now, I enjoyed, to be honest with you, Dan, I wasn't out that much. My first year or two, I wasn't social. Well, I remember being in the gym palace one night, the old Ken era, probably my only time there. The lads would have dragged me out. And I, mem- I remember. Uh, going to the bar, just ordering a car, would have just coached, like, you know what I mean, whatever the lads would have been drinking. And the amount of times the lads would have spoiled me drinks became a bit of a, just a bit of a job. I can never understand it. I mean, I, I don't know if you can remember the first time you had a spirit, like a vodka or a Bacardi or whiskey or whatever it was. I mean, there is a difference. There's a significant difference there in the yeah. car. There? Well, two yeah. shots. <laughs> oh, dude, shots, even vodka in there, isn't it? So I'd, I'd go to me, feed me coke, I'd drink me coke, and straight away I'd be like, "Oh my god, that's, that's horrendous!" Like, so the lads would be giggling in the in the corner. So this was the this is a little this is a bit of a thing, like you know, I mean, I'll have a drink, and so I never did, and it wasn't a big thing, like you know, oh, I don't agree with drinking, or you know, bloody hell, artists, you know what I mean? So. It wasn't that. It's just I wasn't around in Dublin. I didn't drink before I came over, and it wasn't a big thing for me. But I loved the lads. I enjoyed the company. And like I said, I wasn't the most outgoing. But when I did, and when I got you into it a little bit, 
the, and the lads were great company, like some great characters, great stories. You know, so I like being around them. So I'd be out, but not not too much. That Jim Palace, remember that night, and eventually have all my cokes were lined up on the bar. It must have been about eight cokes. None of them were drunk. <laughs> all different spirits, and it was like vodka, vodka. Lads, are not drinking? I said, no, that's vodka. That's Bacardi. I don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah, that one. I'd literally go through that the whole like Everyone had been spiked. So that was... I tell you when I thought I cracked a funny thing. It's that night, so I don't remember because I hadn't been to too many. But I remember being dragged as well. It might have been the second year down to a night, a Zen's nightclub it would have been. Oh, in, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember going in there and I walked there Dan, and I thought, oh, I've absolutely cracked the hair. This is like... This, I could be the West End along. I thought this was like... I'd never seen that like it. <laughs> the lad dragged me upstairs. Said, come on, come on, stay with us, stay with us. I was, yeah, 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 yeah. Drag me up top, VIP section. Oh, lads, I'm not because I wouldn't have been dressed. I mean, my dress attire at the time, damn, you know what I mean? I, 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 clearly, I wouldn't have got admission by myself. So they dragged me into the VIP section. I never turned the corner and, like, literally had to give it a double take. Like, jacuzzi. Yeah. <laughs> jacuzzi. And I, I literally couldn't process it. I couldn't process it for about 20 seconds. I did a couple of people in there, and I'm literally looking at the lads, and they were like, what's the matter with us? I was like, oh, my God. This. I mean, I'd like to say I kind of went and got it, found myself in the jacuzzi, and like, clearly that didn't, that didn't happen. But, uh, yeah, I do remember thinking, wow, this is, this is, this is amazing. This is like a cracker, big story, like, you know what I mean? But they were like that would have been few and far between Dan in terms of me kind of on the on the on, on the Raz. Mm. But that said, anything out with the lads, a bit of golf, I would have picked up a bit of golf around that time and and it would have been always been a few golfers in the camp. So, you know, midweek we'd be out together and and that time. So any type of kind of uh, socializing around the club at any any environment, I was kind of slowly I kind of came out Michelle a little bit during that time, that maybe two years under under Bruce, and you're right, the names that you mentioned in terms of that turnover of players, Alex was a big one. I said the Scottish connection to you, I mentioned it before, but Alex was probably the one the jewel in the crown. When I don't know how much we paid for mm. Bloody hell, Dan, what a player. And he kind of suited me, because Alex was a difficult player to pigeonhole. He, I wouldn't say he was an orthodox right-sided midfield player in a four. Probably more so of a central midfield player. In the modern game, you'd see him as an eight, like an advanced midfielder, two mm. numbers, with a hold them player behind but he was a great, two great feet. He was probably as good as I've played with Dan, being two foot. People say, oh, he's two footed, you know, left foot, right foot. And Alex was that ilk. But I've never seen somebody with a better shot from distance with two feet. He could hit as hard with his left foot as he could with his right. And I remember a goal he scored distinctly up in Pride Park. He played Derby in a league game up there. And he beats Peter Shields about 30 yards. I mean, a good 30, 35 yards down with his left foot. And he absolutely hammered it. Hammer and it was a so called week or four. Now, fair play, Pierce Shields, about four of the eight. <laughs> four of the eight. <laughs> Couldn't get off the ground, like, but even still, that that for me was like, and as, <clears throat> as well as that, he was a very good footballer. So I played right back, and actually, under Mick, Mick played a dime in the midfield for, right, for, for the majority of the season. And that was probably for me, probably Alex's best position because he played kind of right as center. So he wasn't an out and out winger, he was more, and he was kind of more just left as central. So I meant I could do all this running for him because I had my legs then a little bit, a bit Forrest Gump, even with my curls. So I could, I, could, I could get myself on the overlap consistently and he could just find, he could pick me out, Alex, just slide me inside foot, ping it. So I was always a good option for him if he wanted to, to use me. So that kind of, that kind of dynamic uh, played well for us down. That's why I really enjoyed it because I actually enjoyed getting forward by that stage. I was having a bit of joy. I was getting a little bit better technically, kind of practised me crossing a lot. So my cross had kind of improved. And even then confidence. Now you put a few crosses into the box, you get a few goals. Teddy was a great head of the ball. Uh, Teddy was still around uh, for a couple of years after. Then Chris Armstrong came into the football. He was a very good head of the ball. Yeah. And had at least one striker, really good attacking the ball, which helped, which kind of helped me. Dave Mitchell actually was another one who came in towards the death. That was a, Dave was a lovely head of the ball. Yeah, he was, and, yeah. Yeah, and he used to love me. Because he used to say he used to love me. You say, Ken, don't overcomplicate it. You know, if you get get your head up, just put it in the back anywhere in the back post for me because he was very brave, Dave. So they they kind of helped my game having you know lads really good head as a ball, very brave. So we kind of connected well in uh, in that respect. But Alex, you're right. Alex played in that time, and Malcolm as well played just behind the front two, didn't he? Yeah, he, yeah. Like, he no legs, Malcolm, in terms of running into channels. 
but brilliant with the ball in his feet, his back to goal, kind of linking things up. So Mick was very astute there. Mick, at, at some point during his career, got his reputation, like very kind of pragmatic, regimental, a bit like your, uh, we we're talking about there in terms of how his teams played, very kind of functional. But I, I always say to people, say, no, you got that wrong, because as a young manager at Millwall, Mick experimented like 4 4 2. Mick played three at the back. I played in the back three in, in Mick's teams, 3 5 2. The diamond shape we played for a year, that was very successful. So Mick obviously had a look at his players that he had available to him. And as all good managers do, it wasn't a case of this is my style of play, this is how we're going to play. You have to put into it. It was a case of looking at the players which he inherited, Alex Ray. Malcolm Allen saying, well, what, what roles best suit these players? Right, yeah. Acted on them because up front he had good legs. John Gooden was still there. Chris Armstrong would come in, was great, great athlete. And he really, he, his game really polished up. He really improved on the Mick and the coaches who were there at the time. Put a lot of work in with Chris and he developed a very good uh, player. Jamie Morali, Jamie Makeway, as I remember, <laughs> Jamie Makeway and Johnny Goodboy. <laughs> what, why was I called that? <laughs> but Johnny Goodboy because he, He's a good boy. He came from, uh, 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 but he came from nothing. He came from uh, Bromley, Bromley, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Free transfer. And Jamie Makeway was he, Jamie was a Makeway in the deal when Chris Armstrong went to Crystal Palace. They threw in Jamie, didn't they? So they would have had a run. Yeah, they would have had a run of games together. Goody and Jamie would have played together. So I think it. They were well fans, sharp eyes, weren't they? Johnny Good Boy and Jamie Makeway up front. And they had a great little. Jamie had a great run of games, actually, I remember, when he came to the club. Yeah. He well, he about 10 and 10. He went on a crazy goal streak when he came to the I remember him scoring over there. Uh, actually, against West Ham, he got a couple of goals. But he had a great little... Uh, he had a, so that's what I'm saying. With, with legs up front, which you need, running the channels, that type of thing. Mm. Some really creative players in, be, in behind that. Alex and Malcolm, like you said. Andy May was at the club then, had been brought in. Yeah. In the midfield position. Andy Roberts would come into that uh, position because those lads now were coming out of the U team. Andy Roberts, Ben Thatcher, Mark Kennedy, uh, Mark Beard, people like uh, people like that. Very Tony Dolby, very talented players were starting to knock on the door to force him, and that was great. And that was a time when I really developed, begun to develop a little bit of confidence, playing games, and not just playing games, Dan, but making a contribution a bit. You know, feeling it wasn't just a case of you know, that six out of ten. I just done enough. Got boy. You know, I was actually making a kind of maybe creating a couple of goals and defensively doing okay. So my confidence was growing a little bit. And those young lads were coming in. So it was a great dynamic. I really felt part. There wasn't too many players in the squad at that time where I thought, oh, now nice fellas, but I felt as if, oh, there's a bit of distance there. I'm not totally calm. He's a different generation, different mindset. Yeah. Age on the Mick that four season, I was really comfortable with the group, the players that had come in. The American boys came in at that stage as well. Uh, John. John Kerr, Casey Keller. Yeah, Casey, Bruce. Bruce wasn't Bruce Wayne, was it? Bruce was Murray, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bruce Wayne, Jimmy, yeah. Bruce Murray. And they were lovely lads. Casey, great goalkeeper, obviously. Yeah, so the dynamic was really good. And I kind of start really enjoying it. was a lovely time there from start to finish, don't get me wrong. But that's when I really began to feel part of the forge. I was really kind of part of it. Started you know? to thrive. Started to thrive as well in your position. You said that... Um, Obviously, when Mick got, Mick got the job, you said that you really thought that you'd, you know, he invested in you by giving you that too. Do you remember when, because obviously under Riot first season, we make the playoffs. Second season, we fall away. We lose 6-1 at Pompey and he gets sacked um, amidst a um, claim that it was a lot of player revolt started by Mick McCarthy. Do you remember the feeling in the dressing room at the time, like Bruce has got to go sort of thing? Oh, yeah, I don't remember that, uh, to be honest with you. I'm not saying that wasn't the case. I just, um, I just uh, don't remember it. Um, yeah, there must have been a dip. I don't remember how bad the drop off was that uh, second season. That's six one. Obviously, it was a bad result. But obviously, uh, results went great. I do remember a little bit. We'd lost our first team coach. I tell you, we'd lost our first team coach, Dan Steve Harrison. And I want to mention him. And actually, mix number two. Um, he was uh, supposed. He, to be, he was supposed to be mad, wasn't he? I no, he wasn't. He wasn't mad. No, there was a bit of madness to him, but it was kind of. It was. Um, it was kind of not contrived. Like he was a great character, great personality. He was actually a comedian. He could, he could have oh, actually. Sorry, delivered. that's what I mean. Like John Goodman said, yeah. he was hilarious. Said he deliberately fall in likes and things like that just to make you laugh and stuff like. He was brilliant. But I tell you what, as well, he had a great side. He was a great coach, and all great coaches for me have those kind of almost man management. Very good with people. You know, great with people, understand mm -hmm. people, mindset of players. So Harry had that in Evans as well. But he was a little bit of the madness in him, Harry. But he was a great coach. 
he was a great coach and I really benefited from him and Ian Evans at the club during that period. And that was under uh, Bruce originally. Yeah. Um, because they're great coaches and they invested a lot of time with the players and really traditional coaches, as I understood it. I didn't realise at the time, but looking back, the type of coaches I always felt I'd like to become because they great relationship uh, with players, understood players' uh, we, strengths and weaknesses and were prepared to put the time in with individual players to make them better. Their, their kind of mindset was, I'm a coach, it's my job to make this kid a better player. Come the end of the season, every one of these players need to be better. That's, that's my job. Yeah. And they went about that in that way. So I would have done a lot of work with the coaches, one-to-one, Steve Harris and uh, Ian Evans, right, bag of balls out on the training pitch, we need to work on this, your left foot, positional sense, defend them 1v1, all those type of things. And that was great. I loved that. And it actually meant a lot to me because I was, again, a young pro. And these were like, uh, Steve Harris in particular, excellent reputation, but he was still prepared to put the arrows in with younger pros who really hadn't even made that step up. Didn't see them any, any different to the older pros. I'll give you a good example. He would have spent time with me, but the one thing I distinctly remember, Harry, was our goalkeeper, um, Horney. Uh, you remember him in, in goal? Brian Horn, yeah, yeah. Brian Horn. Brian was a great goalkeeper, great goal, but he was great with the ball at, at his feet. Actually, the modern game, Brian would have been better suited to the modern game today. Yeah. Keep respect, have the ball at their feet, ping the ball out. Not that ball nowadays, pe- uh, uh, keepers respect the hits and full backs about 40 yards on the touchline, mm. you know, fizzed over people's heads. Brian could do that like day in, day out. He was absolutely brilliant. But where he wasn't brilliant was in terms of uh, keeping away from the McDonald's driving. <laughs> <laughs> he had this stand up in his car. Every time his car came close to it, it just kind of immediately peeled off. Autopilot. <laughs> <laughs> this was the standard joke, I think, with the lads. He did love his McDonald's and his fast food. He admitted it himself. So he had a bit of a weight issue. And the lads were... He's a great goalkeeper, but he carried a little bit. He was that... It was, it was that build, wasn't it? You could tell like it was a constant struggle with him in terms of his way. He didn't have all the dietitians as there you have today. So, Harry, Steve Harrison, I remember, was like, right, me and you, we're going to get you fit. I want you in here half eight every morning. Half eight every morning, every morning. Get the weight off you. We're literally going to get the weight off you. So, as I said, I would have been in pretty early anyway uh, uh, most days. So, I would have seen Harney would have been high, but he would have come in the car park. Harney would walk in, get, get dressed, black bin liner, Put all his kit uh, over it, like uh, sweat tops, the whole shebang. Walk out, and Harry be waiting for him. Harry been in like a little pair of shorts uh, and a t shirt because Harry would have been very fit even at that age, like whatever he was, 40, 45 years of age. Mm-hmm. Well, Arnie, let's go. So, after around Avery Hill, they'd go every morning. I'd be, I'd be watching them go. Harry be really kind of dainty in his running, and Arnie just like dragging, literally kind of dragging his feet over the ground. But this was it. Every day, week in, week out. And I remember after about six, eight week period, a couple of months, and I remember like saying to Harney, he sweat so through every day coming back home. Preferred to me, preferred to me, came in every morning and put himself through it. I remember one day he was coming through and I said, Harney, how is your, how's your weight, lad? How are you? Because I'd look at him and think. You haven't shifted anything, yeah? <laughs> is that what you're thinking? If <laughs> he's doing that. Yeah, and I, but he, he must have been losing weight because it's a sweat coming off him. Like, little did I know he was jumping his car afterwards and whatever. You know, sat, I was kicking again. But I remember, he used to, I remember him saying to me, yeah, he said, yeah, I'm, no, no, I'm t- two or three pounds now. And I used to say, was that this week? But now, since I've started two or three pounds, so I'm, no, I'm, head, I'm, heading in the right, I'm heading in the right direction, right? And I used to look over at Harry, Steve Harris, and, and Harry was quite slim to begin with. And I got to the stage where I used to say to lads, oh, I get worried about Harry. He was, <laughs> Harry had lost about a stone and a half. I mean, he lost a stone and a half in weight. And he had any weight to lose. And Arnie was, <laughs> Arnie was like, you couldn't, you couldn't even see the way. Out. And eventually it stopped because clearly Brian wasn't committing to the programme. <laughs> working hours. And Harry, I still remember, and it was, I used to, the lads, eventually the lads used to laugh. You go, oh my God, Harry, Harry looks terrible. He looks gone. <laughs> Holy, Holy don't look no different. Harry's nearly blown away in the breeze. Yeah. <laughs> the point was, he put that amount, that's the, that's what amount of time he invested in. Even himself, he put himself through because he thought, I want to benefit the player. And he did that with everybody over a long period of time. Um, Ian uh, Evans as well. And I love that. I, I love the fact they took time to spend that amount of time with me. And I really actually benefited from it. Helped me confidence, helped me game develop. And the reason why I mentioned it is I think 
Harry was shown the door maybe a couple of months before the end of the season, before uh, uh, Bruce Craig uh, got the sack. Mm. And that would have hurt, it hurt a lot of the lads when he went because he was hugely popular. It was a bit of an innocuous thing why he went. It was, you know, it was nothing really. And it kind of hurt. So losing him, and he was a big bridge to the manager. So that bit of an easier talk between players and manager, he, he understood that hard. He recognised and he was the bridge. He kept all the players sweet, kept his spirits uh, up and kept everybody on side, which all good coaches do. So I think the fact that he left uh, Tafsted on, but he kind of stepped away, I think that kind of hurt the atmosphere as well. So that probably contributed to, uh, to it. So it was probably, I don't remember it too well, but for me, that was a big turning point. I was, I was, I was devastated, to be honest with you, when actually Steve Harrison left the football club because I really enjoyed oh, working with him. Well, um, yeah, actually, well, you ain't got to tell the story because John Goodman told the story very respectfully. It was, it was funny. So John Goodman obviously has told the story why he left. Um, and he said, yeah, Mick McCarthy actually went round, all the, wrote a letter, all you players signed it to try and get him back. But that sort of was the beginning of the end for Bruce. Just talk about not the incident, why he got sacked. As I said, we've covered that with John Goodman. But what other sort of things did he do? John Goodman said he'd just roll into lakes and stuff just for the... As good as his coaching was, he said he used to do just some funny stuff. He said he deliberately walked with a cup of tea and go, oh, mate, that is on you, but there's nothing in it. And just stuff like that is how he said it do. Yeah, it's like slapstick. It's like, uh, it was like kind of John Cleese, Faulty Towers. It was that kind of classic British comedy. He seriously was. So he'd regularly walk into, we'd be in dinner at the hotel, an away game in the evening. And you'd, when we'd, we'd dine in the main area of the hotel, so there'd be people in there, families, people kind of well dressed, couples and that. And we'd have a kind of corner in a restaurant. So how do you kind of walk in? We'd all see him walk in, and there might be like a couple of you know a couple of little steps down as you come in into the restaurant, and he would literally throw himself, throw himself down these steps, do, do like a little tumble, like knock over a vase. It was like Frank Spencer. It was literally walking, watching Frank Spencer. But of course, we'd be in on it at that stage. We'd be in on it. We'd be kind of expecting it. But people around the restaurant, it was, the, it, was the, it was the expression on people's faces. People would jump up like, oh, my God, are you OK? And, and he'd make a big thing. But the lads would be absolutely creased up. So it wouldn't be classic kind of one-liners, that type of thing. It'd be kind of more the slapstick stuff. You're absolutely right. I mean, mm-hmm. jumping into a lake and all, all this type of things. But, yeah, they – and it, it wasn't forced. It was in him. It was in his car. It was actually in him, like, you know what I mean? He could have easily pushed it to the side – and get on with things. The lads would have respected him, don't get me wrong. And it was always at the right time as well, because that's what I'm saying, he was very clever, Harry. Those type of things, it wasn't just the case of, I feel like doing it, I'm going to do it. It might be a moment, maybe felt as if players needed a lift or whatever else, just at the right time, then maybe the lads needed a little pick-me-up. He or, little, or a little icebreaker or something like that, you know, just to sort yeah, of... Yeah, exactly. So, so again, for me, even at a young age, I kind of recognised that, uh, even kind of coaches, I was looking at them thinking, wow, what a, why, is he, why is he such a good, good coach? Yeah, he's a good understanding of the game. He's helped me technically in a lot of different things. But just in terms of how we engage with people, the time he gave uh, people, all those things for me were... Because people talk about good managers. Have to, you've got to man manage players as a manager. But for me, as the best coaches are exactly the same. have to have the exact same um, attributes. In fact, more so, because they spend more time with the players. Some and just kind of diss themselves a bit. But the coach is on the training pitch every single day in the video room, wherever it is. You're spending a huge amount of time with the player. So that relationship, that dynamic is absolutely massive. So that was key for me. His presence, Steve Harrison, and Ian Evans as well, was very good to me at that time. Mm. Really key in my development at that time. You were saying um, about the Brian Hong situation where he was struggling to shift weight, and that was the day before dietitians and all that. We discussed, obviously, you wasn't really a drinker, but I think it might be Malcolm Allen just said, that all the boys said how hard you trained, first one out, last one in, but they said that you was ahead of the game, well ahead of the game in terms of your eating and you'd have little bits of tin foil in the dressing room and you'd be eating the right things and they'd be trying to get your tin foil and all that. So what what was that? Was that just a, a self-conscious thing or was you getting advised like, almost ahead of the game in terms of like, what football is now? Yeah, now the lads will be blowing smoke on me backside there a little bit. My diet would have been, I was in digs now for the first couple of years. So I would have been going into digs and dictating the landlady what she was saying me up for dinner. As, as you well know, every day you take, you take what you get. And there's like, and I would, I'd, I'd a very sweet tooth that, I'll be honest with you, and still have. You know, so I'd have regularly now, I'd, I'd uh, drift up to the uh, Sid Cup, Sid Cup High Street on my way to train. And Mick actually caught me one morning. He was driving. He had a big mark. This Mick had just signed for the football club. 
and uh, I'd gone into the bakery uh, on the high street. I'd be way down to train and reasonably early, uh, half eight. I know, I know that's sweet too. So it would be like cream cakes. So, <laughs> no, it wouldn't be, yeah. So I'd be little D, de- I'm giving Brian Horn stick, like, but I'd be detouring into the bakery, get a little cream cake. So I'd be caught me one morning walking down to the train and I'd be getting cream puff. <laughs> <laughs> in my face and he made me jump in the car and he drove me I'm about 200 yards down the road he drove me he was uh, giving me a bit of stick well, sorry was this before he was manager then yeah this was before he was manager yeah, I think he, he was might a have right, okay. so he gave you a bollock and even I weren't the manager yeah, oh, yeah no I wasn't giving you a bollock I had a bit of a laugh to be honest with you so, so I, don't get me wrong I wasn't like I wasn't a nerd in terms of you know no sweets no no this and that I, I really wasn't because I was quite uneducated to be honest with you like most of the lads so I wouldn't say I was that different. Later on in my career, I'd get to the habit of, um, I didn't, I don't remember doing the two offs and a meal, maybe I did, but kind of after games, I didn't eat a lot. Say, for example, I didn't have pre-match meals uh, before games. A lot of lads have, well, nearly everybody have a pre-match meal at 12, half 12, chicken and beans, traditionally. You know, you have your breakfast, then chicken and beans at the hotel, then you go and play at three o'clock. But very quickly, I thought I couldn't function. I remember having chicken and beans and running out to the pitch like for the warm up, and literally like, you know, the food coming up, feeling in my stomach. Mm. So I just thought this was a work for me. So I very early in my career, I, I skipped the kind of pre match meal. So what worked for me was a big breakfast. So I'd get up and have fruit, uh, cereal. I'd have eggs, toast, pretty as, as much as I could, and even a bit of bacon, a sausage, nuts, or whatever. Is load up on breakfast, have no pre match, and then uh, play the game. But afterwards, I was very hungry after the game. Dan, because I hadn't eaten for that in a prolonged period mm. of time. Now, back in the day, there you'd be looking, you'd be looking if you came in and there was like a toffee crisp like on the table, but in the way uh, dressing room, there was no big buffet out for players like pizzas or and that type of thing in the dressing yeah. room. That was it. You had a, a bottle of water, a few drinks, and whatever. So it, early in my career, I didn't realize it back in midwell. I get into the habit, I just make it, I make a sandwich and a, and a couple of bits, and just, yeah, just bring a little, yeah, just a bit of grub in, in <laughs> my back. So after the game, when I sat down, I'd open me little, uh, I'd open me tin foil. I'd have a sandwich. It wouldn't be to be a crisp sandwich. It wouldn't be, but just to get food inside me quickly. Right. For the reason, but well, I was. I was explaining as if you was like years ahead of the game. <laughs> you, had, you had a bit, you had a bit of cheese and Branston pickle to go secretly. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. In fact, I get stick right. The first person who saw me actually cook, so I never cook growing up, and in the digs I never cook because the the old, the old guys used to give me. We feel, but at some point I obviously stepped up, and I think it was the case of oh, pasta. So I never saw pasta growing up in Dublin. My man never, my man never served or said pasta. I didn't know what spaghetti was like uh, growing up in Dublin. We'd like potatoes every day of the week. I tell everyone, we'd like potatoes every day of the week, like chips, potatoes, stew. Uh, I mean, all sorts of like roast potatoes, boiled potatoes. It was like, so pasta was like, this was like pasta. This is a bit exotic, like I'm seeing the lads eat pasta. But, very, but then again, I thought, but yeah, pasta, uh, carbohydrate, right, I'm getting this. So I made myself some pasta in the digs. Now, my first attempt at pasta, and I did it for a few years, was uh, mince out of butchers, chopped a load of onions up, uh, tin of ragu uh, on top, mush it all up, right? So so then I used to think, it used to taste, oh, it's a bit, bit bland, sweeten it up. So obviously, ketchup. You know, yeah. say, when I say literally a bottle of ketchup, I literally, the amount of ketchup I used to put in this pan, you, you wouldn't believe it. And it wasn't until I actually used to share it. I used to eat it all myself, just a pre match meal. Nobody would have it in the digs of my own. So it wasn't until somebody came over, a family member, and actually sat down and ate this thing and literally spat it on the table and said, what, what, what have you put in this? And I was like, well, just your normal bolognese. And they went, if you put any ketchup in there, when yeah, I put a bottle of ketchup in there, like regular. They were like, oh my, it's absolutely disgusting. So this idea of me being that precise in terms of my diet, I'd actually say it's untrue. You get a bit more educated as I got a little bit older, but I was never, I was never, even when I finished, Dan, I, I've always had that sweet tooth. And all any lads I played, even at Birmingham and beyond that, will always say, when that dessert trolley, we used to hear that dessert trolley, that little tingle of the dessert trolley, Coming, <laughs> coming through the restaurant in the hotel. In the cake. <laughs> I was just drawn to it. I was just, I was just drawn to it. So whether it was a, a cake or a jam, or jam rowdy party, whatever it was, I'd be absolutely on it. Don't get me wrong. I, I improved as we all did, as we mm. educated ourselves. But I wasn't any different. Every, all the lads were the same. But that's all it was, Dan, just education. Even when it comes to kind of um, weights, 
I spoke about I needed to get myself bigger and stronger. So it wasn't the case of me going, right, where's the strength and conditioning coach, lads? I need to have a meeting so I can get a program. <laughs> I need to get in a WhatsApp group here and get some stuff loaded down. So as lads would literally point to the gym and the, the car our gym was in the car park in Avery Hill, uh, Millwall. And basically it was a it was a shed on brick stilts. It was a power cabin. Just a yeah. square power cabin, maybe twelve foot by twelve. It was tiny, like just the steps to it. And it was the classic old multi gym uh, in there. It's not a classic old multi gym, bench press, pull downs, a uh, one leg <laughs> one leg machine <laughs> and something. So like four stations just went around in circles for like about 40 minutes. So that was it. It was like, well, i got to get myself strong. Now there's the gym. There's the gym's over there in the car park. So off I went. So you went in there, Dan, and you pushed as heavy a weight. You pushed and pulled whatever was in there, threw it around the gym, lifted as much as you can, done as many, <laughs> done as many reps as you could. In fact, I remember being in there one afternoon late again. Most players, most players would have gone. I was literally... I might have been, it might have been the fact that I was lifting weights for about a year and I hadn't put on like no muscle whatsoever. So I was literally like kept pummeling it, pummeling it, thinking, Jesus, I'll see a muscle soon enough. But I was in there once on my own and I put as heavy a weight on the pull down. Not those ones behind your neck. I was <laughs> Anyhow, it's the heaviest weight I could think. I do about three reps as much as I could. This gave me an extra yard of pace. And the thing snapped. <laughs> it snapped, right? So I literally pulled it down on my head. You know, I literally pulled away, so I cut myself. I cut myself open, so I stumbled out the door. I remember stumbling down the steps. I was a little bit queasy. Most of were gone. There was no cars in the car park. I found my way. Literally found my way into the main building. There was nobody in there, and I was literally holding on to walls. But a blood was streaming down my face. Oh! Thankfully, I went into the physio's room, and Pete, the physio, was there just packing up. He had a look at me, rolled. He got no sympathy off Pete whatsoever. He was old school as well. He was like, no chance of me getting off early today. So he brought put a few stitches in and wherever it was. And my point was, that was it. So that was for the first, I'd say, my whole uh, career at Millwall. That was it, Dan. Yeah. And I look back now and think the amount of time that not just me, we kind of wasted really. Not because we didn't want to work or we went, didn't want to put in the effort, but just put it into the, the wrong areas. Just yeah. didn't have information in terms of diet, physical conditioning. And I, if we had had that information, without a doubt, I could have definitely developed athletically better than I did. Because I was like, I, I, I was never the quickest. I, I always concentrated, as you normally would, on your upper body, thinking, you know, I've got to make myself stronger, you know, chest, shoulders, the whole biceps, the whole shebang. But I, I never realized till about my, my late 20s, and start, start suffering a bit with my groins, that. It was kind of your, your middle area, really, like, you know what I mean, in terms of your core stability was massive. And until yeah. I found out about that in terms of strength and the core stability area of your body, that's where your strength comes from. That's where you plant your feet. Nobody can move you, you know, even in terms of, like, speed. And, I mean, but that didn't arrive for about... I mean, in the meantime, we were literally slinging weights at each other. Like, like Popeye, you just... When a, when a winger turned up, you're just like, look at him, mate, you ain't getting past the, You ain't getting past these. <laughs> They push you over. You were top heavy. It was that. Was always explained to me. Look, you're actually top heavy. If you think yeah. about it, all that weight on the top, he said, when somebody literally pushes you, you're literally, you know, they're literally just pushing you over. You've now like body strength in the bottom half of your body. And it took a while for that to drop before I could actually understand what was what we're talking about. And obviously, adjust and do the kind of work that I needed. But we were all the same back then. We were all. In fact, one thing that springs to mind is um, just to say pre-season. So my first year, I didn't have a pre-season my first year. So I went back to Dublin after that first season. We'd been relegated. And straight away, I got my new contract. But I knew, look, I've got to keep going here. I'm failing. I've got a couple of games. But I need to, you know, I can't. I'm going to get stronger. I need to get quicker. Rah, rah, rah. So I, I remember getting up the following morning after the season ended. Drove up to Hollyhead. And we had a little Nissan micro down. I think it was my first uh, car I got. Drove to Hollyhead from South London. Over, my dad, uh, my mom, dad met me and stuff. And the following morning, jumping out of bed, get my training kit on and running around my local park, doing a few laps, thinking, right, here we go, I've got to get going. So that mm. was it for the whole summer. It was kind of no break. I just thought, I've literally got to get myself going. And I remember coming back to pre season, the first day of pre season in, a in Avery Hill. I remember actually, I do remember being on the training pitch. It was like <laughs> before training was due to start. All of a sudden, there was a, there was a kind of a main road. You probably wouldn't know it between New Eltham High Street. You used to come down to the Cup. That's where the training ground was. All the cars used to come down. And I remember hearing this car. You could hear the tyres. 
beating down the head. And literally, I mean, your head was drawn. All the lads literally like looked to the side. This car was speeding down. It got to the entrance into the train. Eee! Screamed. <laughs> In there, it was like Jukes of, Jukes of Hazard, it really was. On the two wheels down the ramp into the training ground, and like handbrake torn on in the car park. And I remember thinking, Jesus, man, what's getting some robbery? I didn't know what was going on, robbery or something. The doors sprung open. All I saw was first thing I saw was a pair of flip flops come out of the car, right? Bermuda shorts. Then it was, it was, I think it was Terry, and then Terry Horlock's head came out. <laughs> Keith Stevens and a couple of the other lads. They had literally screeched, landed from the airport <laughs> in lads' holiday taxi straight, take me to the train again, flip flops and <laughs> Bermuda shorts. Right, I was got a rubber ring around him still. <laughs> and I remember looking at them, think this was like it wasn't like oh this is outrageous. This it was kind of. <laughs> This, this is, these were the times, you know what I mean? Yeah, it just was, it was what it was. Fair play. I, that was, it was like Hollywood. It was like Hollywood stuff. <laughs> that, was kind of, that was kind of what I aspired to in, in the back of my mind a little bit. And I was thinking to myself, what am I doing, you sad bastard? Like, you know what I mean? You spent the last, last six weeks, like, literally, can you come out for a game of golf? No, I've got to run around the park. I'm doing a bit this and that. <laughs> and that's then arriving the way they did, but... But that who, was it. Who, who, sorry, who got out the car? Who got who, who, who got out the car? Rhino, Terry. What was that lad? Might be Alan McCleary. That that kind of group. Teddy, Teddy might well have been. <laughs> Teddy would I would imagine would have been there as well. Teddy probably got a million dollars to be fair. You know what I mean? We had about two hours sleep, and Teddy would have laughed me going around the train for January. He was that naturally fit. Anyway, Teddy. But that was it. That was the times, wasn't it? So we're talking about terms of diet, your kind of physical condition, and even how you looked after your body, kind of pre-season before you came back to pre-season. Mm. In the off season, like you know what I mean, and, and I do think those players in a different type of environment, and that wasn't the case of those players having a bad attitude or being unprofessional, just like ignorant, really, like like I was, not mm. uneducated, and in a different type of environment, that 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 kind of generation of players, Dan, definitely would have benefited significantly from the players today. That's for me, that's like obvious. That that's that. Yeah, that's it's not. Um, so I wasn't a player; I was a child. But the stories that all you players tell. It was just the culture then. It just was what it was. No one knew any different, did they? No, they didn't. But you know what? It's amazing, Dan. You, you talk to players of that, those generations and even before that, and you, you know, maybe that drinking culture as well, which was around the place, which still would have been uh, prevalent to a certain extent those early years when I played. But you say to them, like, you know, would you swap it? Would you swap it? You know, we could zap you, Doctor Who, take you into the modern era, you know, you know, treble your money, boom, boom, boom. But obviously different environment, you know, you'd have to be a bit more professional, things a bit more structured, and there hasn't been many of any players I've heard say, do you know what, I take it, 